This program is brought to you by Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Well, hello, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, here at Stanford YouTube. Uh, I'm here with Dr. William Furon, Bill Furon, one of my terrific colleagues in interventional cardiology. Uh, he and I are going to chat about uh, aortic valve disease today. Um, Bill, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome. Thank you for having uh, me, David. So tell us a little bit more about what's happening in the world of aortic stenosis. You know, what is it exactly? Yes, yeah, so uh, aortic stenosis refers to the aortic valve, which is one, of the, one of the four valves in the heart that allows blood to leave the left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart, and go to the rest of the body. Uh, the valve allows blood to leave, but it prevents it from coming back into the heart. The issue with the aortic valve is as we get older, uh, calcium can build up on the valve and it can narrow, and this can impact uh, the ability of blood to leave the heart, and it can cause uh, heart symptoms of heart failure. Okay, and what would those symptoms be if someone was talking to their mother or grandmother? What kind of symptoms would they be right. looking for? Uh, patients often will have shortness of breath, uh, chest pain. Sometimes they'll pass out or faint. Um, they can build up uh, fluid in their legs and get swelling. Mm -hmm. Those are the sort of symptoms that we see. And so how does someone make a diagnosis? Do they go see their doctor? And then what happens after that? Well, they often present with these symptoms and their doctor will listen to their heart with a stethoscope and hear uh, a murmur, which is uh, the sound that you hear when the blood's flowing through the narrowed valve. Mm -hmm. And that will prompt an ultrasound or echocardiogram of the heart. And that's the traditional way of, of making the diagnosis. Okay, and uh, what, when, uh, what, is exact, what is an echo exactly? Uh, you know, what is that test? That, is it something that they poke and prod you or is it something that's right. very easy to do? Uh, it's very easy to do. It's, yeah. it's just like an ultrasound sound that a woman who's pregnant undergoes mm. to look at the baby. It's a probe uh, with a little bit of gel that's placed on the chest near the heart mm -hmm. and images are created with the ultrasound waves and um, it's a very accurate way of measuring the flow across the valve and, and visualizing the valve and seeing how well the leaflets are moving. Okay and if they come if the diagnosis of aortic stenosis is then made what happens after that? So the uh, standard method for dealing with aortic stenosis, if it's causing symptoms and it's severe by uh, non-invasive evaluation, is to uh, perform surgery, um, mm -hmm. open heart surgery, where the patient comes into the hospital and uh, has an incision in the chest and a, a new valve, a prosthetic valve, is placed uh, in place of the old valve. Mm -hmm. So are these prosthetic valves, are they made of metal? Are they made from cadaver? I mean, what are some right. of the things that people are putting in, in that valve area? There, there is a mixture of both uh, what we call mechanical valves, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which are um, uh, made of a, a metal type of uh, material, and mm -hmm. bioprosthetic valves, which mm -hmm. have um, either pig or um, cow uh, tissue that is used to make the valve. Okay. And so how is that decision made? Is that made by the surgeon as to what type of valve you would get if you had aortic stenosis and needed a valve replacement? Right. Yes. It depends on the patient's age and mm -hmm. um, other factors, but usually in conjunction with the cardiologist and the surgeon and the patient's preference, the decision is made. So, so what are the good things and the bad things about having a valve replaced? Uh, obviously, you're going to feel better, I would expect. Right. Um, because you have a new valve and now it's not so narrowed. But right. are there bad things about it? What's the risk of the surgery, do you know? Right, well, yeah. the, the issue is uh, currently in, in people who don't have a lot of other um, what we call comorbidities mm -hmm. or illnesses, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, traditional surgical valve replacement can be done very safely at low risk, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps one or two percent chance of a major complication. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue though is our population is growing older and people have more uh, what we call comorbidities, more other illnesses, um, the risk goes up. And we're seeing more and more patients who we'd classify as high risk patients mm -hmm. where the chance of a complication may be 10, 15, or greater percent uh, mm -hmm. of a significant you know, death or having a heart attack or stroke or that sort and of thing. And when you're talking about these illnesses, you're not talking about just like having a flu or cold. You're talking about things like diabetes, right. high blood pressure, and all these other exactly. uh, more serious ailments that, that may be more chronic. Right, and many patients have also undergone prior surgeries, for mm -hmm. example, bypass surgery and um, things like that, which make it more complicated to go back and do a valve replacement later. Okay. so. 
I mean, for these higher risk patients, um, I mean, you're doing some very interesting research into this, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you've been doing uh, recently. Right. Well, one of the exciting areas in interventional cardiology and um, you know cardiac surgery as well is uh, trying to replace these valves less invasively and avoiding uh, the sternotomy and the heart-lung bypass machine. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a large uh, multicenter trial ongoing in the United States uh, called the Partner Study, uh, which is comparing in very high risk patients uh, traditional approaches like open heart surgery to a less invasive way of replacing the valve. Okay, so less invasive, you mean like an angiogram kind of thing? You're talking about replacing a valve without doing an open heart procedure, right. basically, is that right? Exactly, it's very yeah. exciting. The, um, uh, technology has advanced so that uh, these valves are able to be mounted on a small tube or mm -hmm. catheter mm -hmm. and we can place that tube or catheter through an artery in the groin, the femoral mm -hmm. artery, and run it up the main artery that leads to the heart and then uh, basically place it um, within the old valve and mm -hmm. using a balloon expand um, this new valve which is mounted on a stent mm -hmm. or another uh, sort of metal cage mm -hmm. like chicken wire and and uh, then remove uh, all the equipment and what's left behind is this stent with new valve le leaflets inside of it um, that's replaced the old uh, narrowed valve. Well, that, that's amazing. I mean, uh, you're talking about really doing a whole valve replacement in a completely different way than what's been done traditionally. Right. I think the, the uh, key benefits that we found, uh, one is uh, avoiding the sternotomy mm -hmm. and the, the complications that that entails with recovery, and also avoiding the heart-lung bypass machine and its potential mm -hmm. uh, downsides. So, so if a patient has aortic stenosis, can anybody get one of these new uh, valve therapies uh, through the groin, or do they? How do how do they get in touch uh, right. with you? And is this available everywhere, or is it just available right. in certain places? Well, in Europe, there are two of these devices that are commercially available, and people are undergoing this procedure um, on a daily basis. It's not yet that way in the United States, and so the only way is through uh, this one study currently, the Partner mm -hmm. Trial, um, and uh, we're participating in that at, at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And we have a website, um, which uh, if you Google partner in Stanford, uh, the website will come up. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition, uh, our nurse coordinator uh, can be reached um, at 650-725-2687. Okay. And so if, if a patient has aortic stenosis, though, I think in the trial, though, it's a randomized trial. Is that right? Or how does that work? Yeah, exactly? that's yeah. important to uh, mention. First of all, the patient has to go through uh, some... Uh, questions and testing to make sure that they qualify and we're only evaluating high-risk patients at this point. Mm -hmm. And um, then they are uh, randomly assigned to either uh, the open traditional surgery or to the um, valve mm -hmm. in some cases. In other cases, patients who are felt to be too high risk for the traditional surgery are randomly assigned to either um, medical management mm -hmm. or to the uh, percutaneous valve. So the valve that comes through the groin, through the percutaneous the groin. valve. Yes. Great. Yeah. Great. And so so uh, what would you tell doctors and, and patients who might be interested in this therapy? Would you tell them, get in touch with you then at, at the number that you gave? Uh, or would you say, listen, hold on a minute. I'm not sure how this is going to be. There, there, I presume that there's right. some data from Europe or elsewhere. Yes. Well. Um, so this is the first randomized study. And, and we don't have data, obviously, regarding these results yet. But there have been a number of registries and case series that have been done that have been very um, promising. Uh, again, these patients that have been enrolled are very high risk, and based on their predicted outcome, uh, the outcomes that we've seen with the percutaneous valve have been significantly improved. And um, so we anticipate that certainly in the high risk group, this will eventually become the standard of therapy. Uh, as the equipment uh, improves and experience improves, I think uh, it'll extend to even lower risk patients. So, so you think this will eventually replace surgery? You know, it, it's hard to say that right now, but I would not be surprised in five or ten years if the majority of uh, aortic valve replacements are being done with this less invasive technique or some iteration of it. That's great. And that's coming as these, as the technology gets better, it'll be easier to use, the catheters will become smaller, and, hope, and 
these uh, valves will become more reliable? Do you think they'll be as reliable as, a, as their surgical uh, outcomes in terms uh, of yeah. these valves? That's a key question, yeah. the durability of these valves. And unfortunately, we won't have uh, data in people, obviously, for 10 or 15 years from now. There are uh, studies in um, laboratory setting that mm -hmm. suggests they're very durable, but uh, we'll have to wait and see on that. Okay, great. So it sounds like this is a great therapy that we will potentially be able to offer people sort of routinely in the future. I think so. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Bill. I really appreciate sure. you thanks. being here.